Hi everyone, welcome to Concept in Medicine. I know you are happy and glad waiting for the ECG series part two. In this tutorial, we are going to be looking at the standard 12 lead ECG. Let's begin. So the first thing we want to talk about is what an ECG lead is. What is an ECG lead? And when we say ECG lead, you should know that first of all, it can be described as an imaginary line. So if we think, for example, this and this, it can be described as an imaginary line drawn between two electrodes. So in this case, we are having the negative electrode here and the positive electrode here. So in this case, we can say this is a lead, an imaginary line drawn between two electrodes. And the electrode here, we have the negative electrode, which is known as the anode, and the positive electrode, which is known as the cathode. So that imaginary line drawn between the anode and the cathode, that's the electrode, would give you an ECG lead. Another way we can describe an ECG lead is the ECG lead can also be described or defined as the graphical representation of the electrical activity of the heart which can be calculated by analyzing data from several electrodes. And the question comes into mind, then what is an ECG electrode? That should be the question that will be in your mind. When we talk about the ECG electrode, we can see that the ECG electrode is a conductive pad. It's a conductive pad that is attached to the skin to record the electrical activity of the heart. So if you have done an ECG before, you realize that they are going to attach a pad onto your skin. And that pad is what we call the electrode. And there are about 10 of them, depending on the type of ECG that has been done, you have 10 of them being what? Placed or attached to your skin to be able to analyze the electrical activity of the heart. Yes, so that is how to distinguish between the ECG electrode and the ECG lead. I hope we've gotten that. Now, today we are still talking about electrocardiogram, which is ECG. Then the question goes again, what is an ECG? What is an electrocardiogram? The ECG, that is the electrocardiogram, is used to measure the electrical activity of the heart from different locations so as to identify or locate a pathology of the heart. Let's move on to the standard 12 ECG lead. So you should know that a standard 12 ECG lead, from the word standard 12 ECG lead, meaning that there are 12 leads that we are going to be talking about. And one thing you should know is that these 12 leads are divided into two groups. And what are these groups? The groups, we have the first one, the limb leads. There are six limb leads. And the second group is the precordial leads, also six. When we say limb leads, what comes into mind? They are going to be attached to the limb and there are going to be six of them being attached. To obtain the limb leads, the electrode will be attached to the limbs. The precordial leads, to attain the precordial leads, the electrodes will be attached to the chest wall, specifically the precordium. And again, there are six of them. Now, let's begin with the limb leads. For the limb leads, we can divide them into two based on their polarity. There are two types. We have the bipolar limb leads and the unipolar limb leads, also known as the augmented voltage leads or the augmented vector leads. Now, if we take the first one, which is the bipolar limb leads, why are they called bipolar? Because definitely, at the end of the leads, at the two ends of the leads, you are going to see charges. Either one is going to be positive and the other one is going to be negative. And that makes it a bipolar limb lead. For the bipolar limb leads, you can think of lead one, lead two, 
and lead three being the bipolar limb leads. Now, let's move on to the unipolar limb leads. So for the unipolar limb leads, they are so called because they only have a single charge at the end of the lead, either positive or negative, but mostly it's dependent on which direction the lead is facing. But they are only going to have a single charge, and therefore they are referred to as unipolar limb leads. And the unipolar limb leads are also known as the augmented voltage leads or augmented vector leads. And for the unipolar limb leads, the examples, we have the AVR, which means augmented voltage to the right. AVL, which means augmented voltage to the left. And AVF, which means augmented voltage to the foot. It can also be referred or put in another way. That is augmented vector to the right, that's AVR. Augmented vector to the left, that is AVL. Augmented vector to the foot, that is AVF. The next thing that we are going to be looking at is an interesting principle. That is the ectoven triangle. And I believe we all, in one way or the other, have come across triangles in mathematics. Today, we are going to use the application of triangles in understanding ECG. So let's talk about the ectoven triangle. So the ectoven triangle will help us to get the limb leads, the six limb leads that we spoke about. So let's begin with the first one. So for the ectoven triangles, you will need to be looking at the ECG electrodes. Where are you going to place the electrodes? So let's look at the positions of the ECG electrodes. The ECG electrodes for the limb leads, meaning that to obtain the leads, you will need electrodes. And before we talk about the, the positions for the ECG electrodes for the limb leads, you should know that even though we are talking about the standard 12 lead ECG, those 12 leads are going to be obtained from only 10 ECG electrodes, only 10, meaning that the electrodes that are going to be attached to the skin are going to be only 10. 10 of them would give us 12 ECG leads. So we are going to talk about the first four electrodes, which will help us to attain the limb leads that we are looking at. That's the six limb leads that we spoke about. So the first one is going to be an electrode placed on the right arm. On the right arm, there is a specific location for it. It's dependent on the type of ECG that you are using. But mostly, you are going to have the right arm electrode placed at the ulnar styloid process of the right arm. If I say ulnar styloid process of the right arm, all you have to do is to look at your hand. Where the small finger is, that is where the ulna is. So if you come to the wrist, at the level of the wrist, here, it becomes the ulna styloid process. So not of the left hand, not, not of the left arm, but of what? The right arm, the ulna styloid process is going to be here, and that's where you should put the right arm electrode. But you should bear in mind, conventionally, the, the right arm electrode should be closer to the heart. In some ECGs, you will see it being placed on the right shoulder. You will see it being placed on the right shoulder so that it's closer to the heart. Now, for the left arm electrode, it's going to be placed on the ulnar styloid process of the left arm. Then the left foot electrode, you can decide to place it either at the medial or lateral malleolus of the left foot. The standard 12 lead ECG is not going to have any, I mean, obvious significance, but it's also very important is the right foot electrode. And it's also going to be placed at the medial or lateral malleolus of the right foot. So when these electrodes are placed, you are going to have the limb leads in this manner. I'm going to draw a picture of a woman being with these electrodes placed. Let's have a look at that. So let's take this as a woman being. It may look funny, but it's just a representation. So this is the right arm, as you can see, the left arm, the left foot, the right foot. So I'm saying that for the right arm electrode, it's going to be placed at the ulnar styloid process of the right arm. The left arm electrode, the ulnar styloid process of the left arm, 
the left foot, either at the medial or lateral malleolus of the left foot, and the right foot electrode, either at the medial or lateral malleolus of the right foot. So once that is being done, should we connect the imaginary lines that we are talking about? It will give us what? The leads in this manner. Look, the first one from here to here, it will give us one lead. From the right arm to the left foot, another limb lead. Then from the left arm, to the left foot, another limb lead. And that will give you three limb leads. And this is the triangle that we are talking about, known as the Ectoven triangle. So let's have a look at the Ectoven triangle. So back to the Ectoven triangle. The right arm electrode, as you can see, is fixated here. The left arm electrode is here. The left foot, and as I already told you, the right foot would not play an important role in our Ectoven triangle. Now, let me show you a trick. The trick here is that if you look at the ground, Take a building that has just been connected with electricity. And before that is done, a wire is connected to the ground. We call it the F wire or the ground wire. Why is that done? It is done to ensure that any leakages of electrons, that's electricity, which are negatively charged, are conducted into the F or the ground, which is a reservoir of positive charges, neutralizing those negative charges. I hope you get the trick. Now, if that is the case, then you should know that at all times, the left foot will be positive at all times, in whichever direction that you are looking at. It will be what? Positive. And I told you, for the lead, it is going to be between two electrodes. And for the electrodes, they cannot have the same charge at both sides of the lead. At the ends of the lead, they should be oppositely charged. If one side is negative, the other one should be what? Positive. Or the having a single charge, that is all. Now, if we take the first limb lead, that is going to be lead one, you realize that the lead one is an imaginary line connecting the right arm electrode and the left arm electrode. Then somebody will ask, where should the positive charge be? The positive charge should be at where the arrow is pointing to. And if you ask yourself, to which side of the chair is the heart? And you know the heart is more to the left. So in that case, on the left, you are going to have positive charges, unless you are making a reference to the ground, which is a reservoir of positive charges. So in that case, the right arm electrode definitely is going to be negative, as you can see inscribed. Then the left arm electrode is going to be positive. So that will give us the first limb lead we call lead one. So for the lead two, it's going to be an imaginary line drawn between the right arm electrode and the left foot electrode, meaning that it is going to be calculated by analyzing data from right arm electrode and the left foot electrode. And I already told you that the left foot is a reservoir of positive charges, meaning that it's going to be positively charged, and that will make the right arm negatively charged. So that imaginary line becomes lead two. So the lead two is between the right arm and the left foot electrode. What of lead three? It's going to be between the left arm electrode and the left foot electrode. And if you look at all of them, the flow of the electrical activity is going to be towards the positively charged electrode. So in that case, if you take the lead one, it's going to move towards the left. If you take lead two, towards the left foot. And if you take the left, foot, the left arm and the left foot, it's going to move towards the left foot. Meaning that wherever you see positive charges in that lead, that is where the direction of the electrical activity is going to flow. I hope that makes sense to you. Let's move on. Now, let's talk about the augmented voltage leads or the augmented vector leads or the augmented uh, voltage leads. There are three of them. The augmented voltage to the right, as we said, the augmented voltage to the left, and augmented voltage to the right. The augmented voltage to the right, augmented voltage to the left, augmented voltage to the foot. Or you can use in place of the augmented voltage, augmented vector. Now, what you should know is that the augmented voltage leads are unipolar because, as I said, they have only a single charge at the end of the lead, meaning that they are all going to be using the heart as the second imaginary point from which the lead will be drawn. And in that case, they are only going to have a single charge. And how do you obtain the augmented voltage leads? Let's look at it. So if you take the first one, that's the augmented voltage to the right, you will notice that if you take the left arm electrode and the left foot electrode, 
and you divide it into two, that imaginary line that will flow from here, cutting through the heart and moving towards the right arm electrode becomes the augmented voltage to the right. So it tells you that the augmented voltage to the right will be between the left arm electrode and the left foot electrode. That's what it's telling you. If you take the augmented voltage to the left, what are you going to have? It is going to be between, so again, where it is pointing. It is pointing to the left, but where is it coming from? Then it means you are going to take the right arm electrode and the left foot electrode. So it tells you that halfway between that imaginary line going through the right arm electrode and the left foot electrode, being reflected to the left arm would give you the augmented voltage to the left. So in that case, the augmented voltage to the left will be between the right arm and the left foot. Then what of the augmented voltage to the foot? As you can see again, it is moving towards the left foot, but it is coming halfway between the right arm and the left arm. And you can see it's pointing directly to the left foot. So the direction of the augmented voltage to the right is towards the right arm electrode. The augmented voltage to the left, towards the left arm electrode. And augmented voltage to the foot, towards the left foot electrode. I hope that makes sense to you. So again, if you look at the Eithoven triangle, you will realize that the lead two is doing something unique. So if you look at the conduction system of the heart, you realize that it begins from the sinoatrial node, moves down to the atrioventricular node, to the bundle of his, to the bundle branches, and finally to the Purkinje fibers, which are located within the ventricles, causing the ventricles to contract. And if you look at that direction, you realize that it is inclined at this angle. And if you look at this triangle, which of the sides matches with this line? You realize that it will lead to. And why are we saying so? It tells you that if you watch the lead two, lead two will have the most positive deflection, which we'll be talking about in our next video. That will be the, the ECG waves, the P, Q, R, S, T, and the U waves. We'll also go ahead and talk about waves like epsilon waves and all that. So you realize that the lead two will have the most positive deflection and thereby is most aligned with the direction the electrical activity of the heart is traveling. So if you watch that, what I mean by that is that the lead two is going to be in the axis of the conduction system of the heart. And that will make the lead two the most important ECG lead. So in ECG, electrocardiogram, the most important lead is lead two. That is why if you look at an ECG strip, at the bottom, you are going to have the lead two restated there again. You are going to have the graphical representation of lead two deputed at the bottom of every ECG strip. It tells you that the ECG lead two is the most important lead. I hope that makes sense to you. And if you want more information on the conduction system of the heart, you can just roll back to the previous video I uploaded on my channel, named the conduction system of the heart, well and clearly explained. So with respect to which aspect of the heart these leads are going to be observing or watching or looking at, let's talk about the leads in category of that. And if you look at the Eithoven triangle, you will realize that lead two is looking where? It is looking down. As you can see, it's looking down at the foot. Lead three, where is it looking at? It is looking down. Telling you that they are all looking down. If you say down, it's inferior. Look at the augmented voltage to the foot. Two. Where is it looking? It is looking down. Meaning that lead two, three, and AVF are inferior leads. They look at the inferior aspects of the heart. By that, we will classify lead 2, 3 AVF as inferior leads. If we take lead 1, where is it looking? It's looking to the side, towards the left. If we take lead AVL, where is it looking? It's looking towards the left, which is to the side. So in that case, lead 1 and AVL will be considered as lateral leads. I hope that makes sense to you. Then someone will be asking, what of AVR? In the standard 
12 led ECG, the EVR does not really have a significant effect unless there is a right ventricular infarction where the position of the leads are going to be changed. We'll talk about that when we get to the precordial leads. Okay, now let's talk about the precordial leads, which are also six in number. So for the precordial leads, there are six of them. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Now let's look at their position. How are they placed? So to be able to place the precordial leads, first of all, you would have to note an anatomical landmark known as the angle of Louis, or what we call the sternal angle, or what is also known as the manubrial sternal junction. And if we talk about the angle of Louis, you have to know that the sternum is made up of three parts. The manubrium, the body of the sternum, or what we call corpus sterni, and the xiphi sternum. If you take the manubrium and the corpus sterni, or the body of the sternum, there's a junction between them. That junction is felt as a transverse prominence on the sternum, and that is referred to as the angle of Louis, or the sternal angle, or the manubrial sternal junction. And as you know that the angle of Louis corresponds to the second rib. The second rib, it corresponds to the second rib. And if you extend laterally, you are going to enter into the second intercostal space. Once you are able to enter into the second intercostal space, then what can you do? You can move, you can start counting the number of intercostal spaces downwards. If you move down, you are going to enter into the third intercostal space. If you move again, the fourth intercostal space. And the fourth intercostal space is going to be of great relevance to us. Meaning that the V1, the V1 lead the electrode is going to be placed where? In the fourth intercostal space, right sternal border or right sternal edge. For the V1 lead, the electrode is going to be placed where? In the fourth intercostal space, right sternal border or right sternal edge. For the V2, the electrode is going to be placed in the fourth intercostal space, left sternal border or edge. What of V3? V3 cannot be placed if you've not already placed the electrode for the V4. So we'll jump this V3 and go to the V4. So for the V4, it's going to be placed where? In the feet intercostal space, left midclavicular line. Then once you have been able to attain or achieve the V4 lead, then you will draw an imaginary line between the V2 and the V4. Halfway between this line, is where you are going to put the electrode for V3. So the V3 is halfway between the V2 and V4 leads. V5, where is it going to be? It is going to be in the left anterior axillary line, same plane as V4. If I say same plane as V4, it means it's also going to be in the feet intercostal space. Then the V6, where is it going to be? In the left mid axillary line, same plane as V4, meaning again, it is also going to be in the fit intercostal space. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, looking at this, which aspect of the heart does each of these lead look at? So if you observe very well, V1 and V2, they are just close to the septum. Because of that, we'll call them the septal leads. V3, V4, if you move here, V3 and V4, they are on the anterior aspect of the heart, thereby known as the anterior leads. V5, V6, where are they going? They are going into the axilla. Once it's in the axilla, we'll say that they are to the side. And if they are to the side, then they are lateral. Therefore, V5, V6 are lateral leads. Now, assuming there is a, a deficit or there is an infraction at the posterior wall of the heart, how would you be able to elicit that on an ECG? To do that, these leads will not be enough. You will have to bring in extra leads known as V7, V8, V9. Now let's talk about the placement of those leads known as the posterior leads. 
So for the posterior is V7, V8, V9. Why is V7 placed? V7 is placed in the left posterior axillary line, same plane as V6, meaning that it's also going to be in the feet intercostal space. What of V8? V8 is not the name of a vehicle in this scenario, but rather a lead that we are considering. So it's not about the V8. V8, that's the ECG lead, is going to be placed at the inferior tip of the left scapula, same plane as V6, meaning that it's also going to be in the feet intercostal space. Then the last one, which is V9, where is it going to be? It's going to be placed at the left paraspinal line, same plane as V6. And these leads, they would help you to identify and locate a posterior myocardial infarction. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, let's take all the leads, the 12 standard lead ECG together and identify them with the aspect of the heart that they look at. Taking the standard 12 lead ECG, we want to look at for each of the leads, which aspect of the heart do they look at? Which aspect are they looking at together as a whole? So if we take the lateral leads, lead one, as we said, looks laterally. Lead AVL looks laterally. V5 and V6, as initially mentioned, also looks laterally. The septal lead, we said, V1, V2. The anterior leads V3, V4, and the inferior leads 2, 3, AVF. So in that sense, if you should have an XT segment elevation in lead 2, 3, and AVF, then you can say categorically that that is an inferior XT segment elevation myocardial infarction, or simply an inferior stemi. If you should have an XT segment elevation in lead 1, AVL, and V5, then we can say that is a lateral XT segment elevation myocardial infarction, or simply put, a lateral stemi. If it is in V2 and V3, then we can say it is constituting the septal lead and anterior lead. Hence, it is an anteroceptal myocardial infarction. And if it's an ST segment elevation, then it becomes an anteroceptal XT segment elevation myocardial infarction. I hope we got that very clearly. Now, when we were talking initially, I made mention that the AVR does not play a significant role in the standard 12 lead ECG. What if there is an infarction in the right ventricle? If in the case of a right ventricular infarction, what should be done? That is where a special lead comes into place. Let's talk about that lead. So now, I was saying that there is a very useful lead that we want to look at. We call it the V4R. V4R, lead V4R. Why are we calling it V4R? Meaning that it has something to do with the precordial lead 4. That's what it means. And this lead is useful because it is used to detect a right ventricular infarction. How is this lead placed? So to place the lead V4R, which is a very useful lead, all you have to do is to move lead V4, which is in the feet intercostal space, left midclavicular line, lead V4R is placed by moving the standard V4 precordial lead from the feet intercostal space, left midclavicular line, to where? The feet intercostal space, right mid clavicular line. And if that is done, then it becomes known as the lead V4R. V4R. It is placed in the feet intercostal space, right mid clavicular line. All you have to do is to move the V4 from its original feet intercostal space, left mid clavicular line, to where? The feet intercostal space, right mid clavicular line. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, the last few things I want us to look at is another special lead which was discovered or first described by the Welsh cardiologist by name Thomas Lewis in the year 1913. And that lead, we call it the Lewis lead. The leads were named after him. So let's talk about the Lewis lead. So back to the Lewis lead. We said Lewis leads were discovered by Dr. Thomas Lewis, as a Welsh cardiologist who first gave the description to the Lewis lead 
in the year 1913. The Lewis Neves are also known as the X5 leads. How can we place these Lewis leads? So the Lewis leads, what we are going to be doing is that we are going to use the bipolar limb leads to create the Lewis lead. But before that, what are the uses of the Lewis lead? First of all, the Lewis leads are used for detecting flatter waves in atrial flatter. That's the first use. Then, the next use of it is that it can also be used to detect the P wave in a wide complex tachyarrhythmias so as to identify an actual ventricular dissociation. I hope you've got that. Then the next question is, how are these leads placed? So what we are going to do is that we are going to be working with the bipolar limb leads. What are these? So in this case, we are going to move the right arm electrode, as we initially say, the ulnar stylet process of the right hand or the right arm. We are going to move the right arm electrode, which was formerly placed at the ulnar stylet process of the right arm to the manubrium. So the right arm electrode is moved to the manubrium. The left arm electrode is moved into the feet intercostal space, right sternal border. And the left foot is moved to where? The right lower sternal border. And if you do that, what is it going to be doing? It is going to be detecting atrial activity and its relationship to the ventricle. So if they are flatter waves, definitely the Lewis lead will be able to what, identify them. I hope that makes sense to you. All right, the last thing we want to talk about before we conclude our ECG series part two, which is the standard 12 led ECG, is taking a look at the Fontaine leads. They are also special leads. What are they special in? So the Fontaine leads are used to increase the sensitivity of epsilon wave detection. Then you'll be asking me, what is an epsilon wave? Definitely, it's a question that would interest you. So an epsilon wave, as you know, if we take the ECG waves, we have the P wave, the Q, R, S, T, and U, and so forth and so on. But for the epsilon wave, it's a small positive deflection buried at the end of the QRS complex. So this becomes the QRS. Q is supposed to be here, but it's not there. This is the QRS complex. At the end of it, you are going to see a small deflection. So this becomes the epsilon wave. So this becomes the epsilon wave. There is a small positive deflection buried at the end of the QRS complex. That's what we call the epsilon wave. So if you want to detect the epsilon wave, then you have to use the fronted leads. The fronted leads can also be used to identify atrioventricular dissociations, okay? And it's also a lead useful in detecting posterior myocardial infarction, but it's not a major thing for it. But standardly, it is used to increase the sensitivity of epsilon wave detection. Now let's look at how the fronted leads can be placed. So just as the Lewis lead, we are going to be dealing with what? The right arm, left arm, and left foot electrodes. Now let's look at that. For the fronting leads, the right arm electrodes are going to be placed at the manubrium. What of the left arm? The left arm electrodes are going to be placed at the xiphy sternum. Then the left foot electrode, where are they going to be placed? They are going to be placed at the position of V4. And what is the position of V4 again? It is in the feet intercostal space, left mid clavicular line. So when you have that, then you are going to have something looking like this, like this. So this is what you are going to have. And in this case, you are going to have your first lead looking downward, then it becomes F1. You don't call it lead one again. Then you have this one looking here. You are going to have F2. Then this one looking down here, you are going to have F3. So if we have it like that, then the leads become known as what? The Fontaine leads. So you have Fontaine lead one, Fontaine lead two, and Fontaine lead three. And I hope you've made sense out of our ECG series part two, where we delved into the standard 12-led ECG. Kindly make sure to subscribe, comment, 
like and share and also feel free to tell me which concept you would like to see in my next video thank you very much and once again this is concept in medicine bye bye